joining us in this lecture. We have a very special guest today. We have an, an invited guest, Farah Al Barwami. She is uh, formerly as, at SKU, and now she is R and D manager at uh, Bea, I, I believe. And um, yep. we've been talking about Bea for the last few lectures and the important role it has as a public public company in introducing and uh, creating a pathway in which Oman uh, becomes a green country and have a sustainable management of its solid waste and hazardous waste also, uh, municipal waste. And he's been doing a great work on that. And I, br I brought some data for you before, but now I, I really understand that my data was outdated and there's a great opportunity for you to know in first hand how is the position of Oman today uh, from uh, 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 from Bea directly from the, the company doing this and it's a great opportunity for you to ask questions and, and uh, give your your own ideas and insights also. There are many uh, uh, initiatives from Bea also that welcome innovation from youth uh, into um, bringing uh, uh, new players and new ideas, new scenarios, new projects for Oman to become a greener country and a more sustainable country. So uh, without further ado, I will just hand the word for uh, Dr. Farah to uh, introduce herself and start her lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Dr. Daniel said, I used to teach at SQU and I am not used to teaching uh, this distance learning um, and uh, online. So I'm gonna have to ask you guys all for a big favor. Um, I'm used to a big class, so I'm gonna ask you to interact with me. If I ask questions, please try and answer so I don't feel like I'm talking to myself, yeah? Um, if you can do that for me, then uh, I'll be very grateful. And I always like to hear what you have to say. Um, so let me present my screen. Uh, I mean, do... Uh, yeah, Victor, we can see it. You can see it? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now let me see if I can see it because it's gone away from my screen. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so as we said, I'm uh, Dr. Farah Al Barwani, Research and Development Manager in uh, BIA. And I'm just going to give you a kind of a highlight of some of the things that we do and one of our biggest focuses. Um, now, as you know, we are in charge of waste management, but more than that, what we're striving to do is move towards circular economy. So let me explain a bit about that. Uh, first of all, uh, what's the waste situation like in Amman? Um, we produce around 1.2 kg per capita per day. Now, that's quite a bit of waste per person. Um, of course, not all of our waste is going to be produced where we are because there's the restaurants, there's the places of work, there's the street cleaning. So basically, there's a lot of waste that is produced, um, I guess, for each of us that is produced in other areas, if that makes sense. But in general, we have around 1.2 kg per, per person. Now, that's quite a bit of waste. And one of our goals is to try and reduce that. Um, because at the moment we're handling around 2 million tons of waste. Uh, that was in 2018 and it's gone up since then. Now, what is our waste composition? We've got uh, a large proportion of food waste, uh, then comes plastics, and then we've got all the others, whether it's wood, paper, textile, metal, and so on. So quickly about BIA, um, our vision is to conserve the environment of our beautiful Amman for future generations. Um, uh, we really are focused on that, not just waste management, but what that means to the country. Um, so initially we started with damage control, fixing what was there before, uh, building infrastructure so that we could do waste collection. And now we're trying to develop the sector and support Amman's economy. So the Royal Decree to initiate BIA started in 2009. Um, we really took over healthcare waste in 2011 and we started uh, MSW or our um, Municipal Solid Waste Collection in 2015. So what was there before? We had open dump sites. So the trash was uh, 
piled up in open areas um, with uh, no um, uh, real proper landfills designed. And now what we've done is we've put uh, proper engineered landfills to international standards. Now, I'm going to ask you what you think the issues that could arise from the first, from before, the situation that we had back then. Does anyone have any ideas on why we needed to convert? No? Did you ask why did we need to convert the open, open dump sites to landfills? Is that the question? Yes. Because everything was thrown there um, unorganized, pests, mm -hmm. and pests, pests would come there. Okay, excellent. So that unorganized mess can mean that it takes a lot of volume. Well, now we can compact it. So that's excellent. Yes. What else? And like the pest control, because I'm sure all the animals and insects would love excellent. the Excellent. Pest control was a big thing because, I mean, uh, like you were saying, you've got uh, rodents, things like that, uh, mosquitoes. Uh, the more controlled you are, uh, the better. And so with our controlled landfills now, we've reduced uh, the risk of pests. What else? Look at the bottom picture. Is that a nice, beautiful lake? Dr. Farah, um, the, the PowerPoint is not presented. Like you haven't presented the PowerPoint. Oh, I haven't? Because mm. I've shared screen. Yeah, the screen is shared, but the PowerPoint is not presented. So what's shared? This, your screen is shared. Now, now you just change the slides. Perfect. Because I could see the presentation window. Um, so um, basically, if you look at the, the, the water at the bottom, what do you think the problem with that is? And animals can eat the, all the waste there. Mm -hmm. And so that can be bad for the animals, but also waste tends to produce what we call leachate. Now leachate can be toxic um, and hazardous, and we need to make sure that that doesn't go into the ground because if it goes into the ground and goes into our fresh water table under, that can contaminate our fresh water. So essentially what we needed to do with all these things that you all mentioned is try and make it a more safe uh, situation to handle our waste better and transition. So in the past, we had over 300 open dump sites, uh, two transportation stations and two sanitary landfills. Now you can see uh, that we needed 300 open dump sites because the waste was just piled on top of each other. Now in the present, what we've done is we've decommissioned um, most of those dump sites, all the large ones, over 300 of them. Um, We've built instead 10 engineered landfills. And you can see by managing waste correctly, instead of 300 open dump sites, you can, you can be able to um, uh, you know, handle our waste within a smaller area. So we've got 10 engineered landfills, uh, 14 transfer stations to make the system more efficient, uh, 800 or over 800 collection vehicles, and a large uh, team that collects the waste. And basically what we've done is we've managed to take over waste management in all of Oman. Now, what is our goal? Now that we've taken over the infrastructure, we're collecting the waste, we need to, or what our goal is, is now to support Oman in moving towards circular economy, to try and support Oman's economy. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what a linear economy is, but that's really what we have, where we take natural resources, as we explore and we take them out of the earth, we get waste. We use them to make our products. As we do that, we make production waste. Yeah, so if I'm making a laptop, if I'm making uh, even packaging food, that process will produce waste. And then what we do is we sell it or use it and finally it gets disposed. So at each of these points, we're producing waste. And at each of these points, we're using natural resources, uh, power, we're using um, uh, water, and so on. 
So what we need to try and do is shift to a circular economy. In that case, what happens is you produce, you distribute, you consume, and whatever is left, that waste can be then brought back into the production cycle. Now that can be through recycling, that can be through waste to energy and so on, but I'll go over that uh, a bit later. But the whole point is that we reduce waste and add value. And we slow down the rate, rate at which new resources are extracted um, to make it more sustainable. So waste management hierarchy. So how are we going to achieve the circular economy? Or how does BIA look at achieving circular economy? Now, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but usually this pyramid is the other way around. Okay. Because um, uh, currently, what do we do the most? Reduce, recycle, or dispose? Dispose. Dispose. Excellent. So this is not what we currently have. This is what we want. Ideally, the first thing we do is reduce. We talked about how in Oman we have 1.2 kg per capita per year. We want to reduce that. You know, how do we make sure that we're producing less waste? Then reuse what we can, recycle what we can, recover what we can, and very little should be disposed. So how is BIA trying to do that? Let's go one step at a time. So like we said, what should be happening the most is reduce. Now, of course, that's not something that BIA can do uh, by itself because every person in our society produces waste. So the biggest thing is to come to all of us uh, to, to raise awareness and really make people understand the importance of reducing waste. So what we do is we arrange awareness campaigns, um, university and college visits, school visits. We are trying to introduce um, some of these concepts into the school curricula. And the idea is that every person in our society understands the impact that their waste is having. The next thing is reuse. Now, what are some of the ideas for reuse? Um, one is this over here. So instead of using a paper cup or a disposable cup for your coffee, take a reusable cup. Instead of taking a small bottles that uh, you have to dump, plastic bottles, use a reusable uh, water bottle. So utilize reusable items as much as you can. Give waste a second chance in the form of art. And this is something that I've seen in a lot of uh, SQU competitions and things like that. And what we've done at a larger scale of what we're doing is collaborating with SQU to make a reuse center. Now, I'm not going to go over the details so that it doesn't take a lot of time. But basically, what the idea is, is uh, bringing our items, the, the uh, let's say, the bulky waste, uh, old chairs, old furniture, old electronic equipment, old clothes, how can we take it refurbish it and make it better than it was before in some cases and give it a second life. Now, the idea comes from uh, a lot of the European uh, op shops or secondhand shops, but we really do believe that something like that in Oman will really make a big difference. Um, the next thing is to recycle. Um, now, I'll ask you guys this question. What do you think the difference between normal production and waste recycling is? It's a hard question. Maybe the waste recycling product will be a bit uh, cheaper. Okay, that's a good point. If you manage to do your collection, it can be cheaper. And the main thing is that you're using material, uh, yes, so so it, in order to make it cheaper, what we need to do is make the uh, material available. So what does that mean? When we talk about normal production, we know where to get our plastic, which process we do to get it. We know where we're going to get our metal and so on. When we talk about recycling, what we need to make sure we do is we collect enough feedstock or enough items in order to make recycling possible. So we actually have a number of plans at BIA, um, but you can imagine collecting clean waste for recycling can be difficult. 
So one of our focuses also is not just taking material from waste, okay, in the form of recycling, but to take energy from it. So what we can have is, let's say, even a wet bin or a dry bin, and we're doing this currently in a trial in Masqat. Um, that can then get separated. And then the idea in future is that we can use that waste to get biogas um, and to go to recycling facilities and waste to energy. And so by the time you go to the landfill, very little is landfill. Most of the other uh, material has been taken through recycling or biogas or waste to energy. Please, if you have any questions at any point, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to ask. But currently, all of these processes are in development. We are working on a biogas project. We are working on a waste energy plant. We are working on um, recycling uh, facilities. And we are trialing um, a two-bin system to segregate waste. So we are moving towards this eventuality. Now, what recycling does happen? Well, uh, currently, there are a few uh, wood recycling facilities. Um, there is a, a bit of tire recycling in terms of material, but also using um, end life tires for energy. Um, we've got lead acid battery recycling. Um, we recycling or electrical items, um, that at the moment is not happening uh, effectively. We haven't really initiated that, but we are trying to uh, at least get to the point where we're safely disposing it. Um, paper and cardboard, that is starting, but st still a lot of our paper and cardboards gets taken out of the country. Uh, PET recycling, glass recycling, textile, textile collection, and fish, fish waste. So all of these are options uh, and projects that BIA is working on. Now, with our energy recovery, um, we've got uh, waste to energy. We've got... Um, waste ELT, which is waste tires to energy. We've got a bio waste and waste cooking oil or waste oil to biodiesel. So these are also all projects that we are currently working on in BIA with, in collaboration with different partners. And the idea is if you can transition, then you can reduce approximately uh, 4, 000, uh, what you call it, 430,000 tons of CO2 emission. You can contribute to Amman's commitment towards uh, reducing CO2 uh, emissions and help us achieve uh, our goals. Now, of course, the last option or what we hope it in the future will be the last option for waste management is landfilling or disposal. So when we were talking about our engineered landfills and I told you that we were trying to make them safe and that these were up to international standards, instead of dumping the waste over or on, on uh, land where it's not compacted, what we do is we design engineered landfills where the landfill is lined properly to prevent that leachate um, seeping into the ground, like I told you earlier, um, and the waste is compacted and basically overall it's covered um, every night to make sure that pests can't come and uh, cause a problem. So dealing with all those issues that we talked about at the beginning. Now challenges, I'll ask you guys, what do you think challenges are for waste management? Let's say if we want to transition towards circular economy, what do you think would make it hard? Maybe um, the idea that not very many companies are willing to take recycled materials and invest in them. That's a if, like, very they are good point. To... Very good point. And yes, um, basically, if we want to um, use recycled uh, construction material for roads, we need to have somebody who's willing to take that uh, recycled material and use it. So we really do need to make sure we build that infrastructure. Anything and else? Also, not, not all type of the waste can be deal with it or, uh, or can be recycled. Yes, not all waste can be recycled. 
So the idea is that we take as much as possible for recycling. Whatever we can't, we then try and get energy out of. And whatever we can't goes in the landfill. But yes, not everything can be recycled. And one of the main things that limits recycling is the quality of the waste or how clean it is. So if I want to recycle plastic and I collect plastic from people's household bins, that waste is very contaminated. It's got food, it's got, you know, so in order to use it, I have to make sure I clean it and wash it, which uses a lot of resources. And that makes it less um, feasible and less less of a, well, basically the whole point of recycling is to try and, and, and uh, reduce our impact on the environment. But if the waste comes in contaminated, then you use so much resources in order to, to clean it and get it ready for recycling that you're limiting your benefit to the environment. Good, very good point. Anything else? Well, I mentioned that we need to have clean-ish waste. Where do you, why do you think that might be an issue? Sorry, what did you say? What did you say? Clean what waste? That we need to have clean waste, right? So how, why do you think that would be a bit difficult? Awareness, I guess. Exactly. That's one of the biggest challenges is awareness. What we say is that we need to build capacity in the society. So us as BIA can't be doing everything. We can't do the reduction ourselves. We can't really even do the uh, segregation ourselves. We can make the platform available. We can give two bins to each household, but us as the Omanis, as the people, need to be um, the ones who actually reduce our consumption or our waste. And we need to be the ones who, re, you know, uh, segregate and uh, really uh, clean, uh, organize our waste and, and manage it correctly. So I think you guys talked about a lot of it, lack of awareness, mixed waste and lack of segregation, which again kind of ties into awareness. Lack of enforced regulations and accountability, again, sort of, you know, making sure that uh, uh, people can't just dump waste uh, in places that are out of, uh, that are, that they're not supposed to be in it, like wadi beds and things like that. Also, waste management is very expensive. Um, it is a very, very expensive service. Um, if you think of it in terms of uh, not just the staff who do the collection, but uh, the running of the trucks and so on, the logistics, um, it, it's a costly exercise. Um, also, it takes time. So it takes time to build the infrastructure uh, and it takes time to build capacity, like we said, to spread the awareness. And so BIA has done a lot of work on building the infrastructure. And now what we're doing is we're building the capacity and moving towards building the infrastructure needed for recycling and uh, moving to our, a circular economy. But as much as we say that there are challenges, there's a lot of opportunity. We have, um, as we transition to circular economy, there's so many ways that we can capture value from waste. There's different waste streams that need to be studied. We haven't even identified all the opportunities that are out there. Um, and uh, by the more we study where Oman is at in Oman's current situation, and the more we understand where the opportunities are. So if we know what's next for Oman, what's missing, uh, you know, that allows us to really bridge that gap. And that is something that we are currently working on. Now, in terms of slides, I think I've gotten to the end of my slides. I might send uh, a video uh, for you guys to watch if you're interested that kind of highlights what circular economy is. Um, but basically, really try and build that, as we said, the capacity. Uh, whether it's through awareness campaigns, um, what, one thing that I'm running at the moment, I don't know if you've heard of it, is Eco Innovate. It's a program that uh, basically supports uh, SME development. So if you have a company, a small company that is looking at circular economy um, or sustainability, how do you um, 
really use our waste to to produce high value products or if you're doing something that is looking at uh, like um, let's say making uh, a product from a natural resource and doing it sustainably then what we can do is help uh, accelerate uh, or or develop your business skills to help accelerate your SME growth. So we have an SME accelerator called Eco Innovate Oman. Um, you can find the information online. So if you know of anybody who has a company and they are looking, um, we are planning on launching a new round of uh, Eco Innovate inshallah this year. But in addition to that, um, we do studies in collaboration with different universities, trying to understand again, where Oman is currently with our waste and trying to identify solutions. Um, and uh, um, like we said earlier, let me go back. We're working hard on trying to develop as many of these recycling areas as possible, as well as the waste to energy. Now with that, I come to the end of my presentation and I'd like to say thank you for engaging with me. Um, I didn't feel like I was talking to myself. I felt like I was back at SKU teaching an amazing class of students. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll leave the floor to you if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Farah. Uh, certainly you got a lot of engagement. You have a, quite a skill to, to get the students to participate, M much more than I can, actually. Uh, I will leave the floor for the students now to ask more questions if they want, and if they, if they don't have, do not have more questions, I will ask some. Uh, but uh, actually it would be better if the students come come and ask their questions at the moment. I have a question. Uh, Perfect, Dick, I like Dr. Farah, you, have, uh, you had mentioned before that uh, paper uh, export or something like that out of a man, why? That's a very good question. And that's one of our biggest issues. Remember, let me see if I can get the slide. Remember when I talked about one of the biggest things for recycling is to facilitate material availability. We need to make sure that the material is available. Now, back in the day when we had open dump sites, those dump sites used to have scavengers. So we showed you camels uh, eating there, but it's not just animals that used to use the waste. Humans used to come and take the waste, collect it as much as we, they could and export it out to let's say other countries to recycle them there. So they take it out to use it. Now, what we want to do is try and make sure that that value is retained in country. So it's not somebody else that's taking benefit and of the resources and the material available in our waste, but that we do it here in Oman. Now, oh, there are regulations to stop people from taking waste out, but you can imagine it can be difficult because if somebody, I mean, it's a bit different now, but especially when we first started trying to stop people from taking things out of the border, if somebody goes to the border with a big with a big truck full of uh, empty cardboard boxes, most people just look at that and say, "Okay, zbal adi rohu," right? Just go. It's dustbin. It's not. It's waste. Now, in order to change that, we had to again raise awareness, make people understand that these items have value. and to, to push for the regulations in order. I hope I answered your question. Yes, actually, you answered. But uh, first, I thought that not uh, people from public who take, uh, who, uh, take this waste, I thought that uh, the company not able to deal with this, this old papers waste. Okay. But, so, yeah. Well, yeah. well companies but small companies that want to use it as a resource but yes yeah thank you it's, it's a it's a very com waste is a very complicated uh, um, uh, system <laughs> but basically a lot of the world was using waste as a resource long before we started so when we were still dumping it uh, in open landfills other people knew that that was a value and they were using it. Um, so now we're just trying to make sure that we can use it. 
In the same subject, uh, there is a lot of uh, all developed countries, uh, let's say Europe or North America, there's quite a lot of uh, waste export. They, they, mm -hmm. they have a, a good system of separation of recyclables, but the, the many countries have done very little of uh, actually implementing the, the, the recycling facilities. And many countries in Asia, especially China uh, and, and other South Asian countries are receiving huge ship shipments of recyclables before separation and they are dealing with all this uh, uh, recycling uh, of this waste and this is, has become quite a waste war these days mm -hmm. because of the the um, every time you have some sanctions uh, the, the the immediate response will be just stop the importing of the waste and these things pile up in USA and other countries and uh, it, it's a very sensitive topic uh, and what are the regulations in, in Oman with regards both to export and import of uh, recyclables? So currently, um, for most waste streams, of course, it's uh, usually a per waste stream, right? Uh, because if you're putting uh, a regulation and, and you expect somebody, let's say, order police to uh, be able to control it, they need to know exactly what they're looking for. Are they looking for cardboard boxes? Are they looking for tires? Are they looking for electronic items? Um, but we have, uh, or we are still in the process, but uh, we have actually made uh, quite a bit of progress to stop or limit export. So usually now you need to have permission um, or in order to, to export waste. Um, in terms of import, I think at the moment we don't import recyclables. We don't import uh, other people's waste. Uh, we're not at the point where we can we can use it yet. Um, maybe in the future when we have recycling plants and those are up and running and we've got the infrastructure, then we could look to doing that. But part of the issue can be, as you mentioned, um, if you collect and segregate your waste without having the recycling infrastructure or waste to energy plant or really know what to do with it, you have to send it abroad. Now that's expensive. And at the moment, we in Oman are blessed. Our waste is provide our waste management is provided by the country. So what the country would have to do is pay for more for waste collection because now it's not just one bin per household, you're talking about two bins. So you have more collection, that's added cost. Um, then to keep it separate, also that's costly. Then we would need to send it abroad and that's extra cost. And most of these countries don't just take your waste for free, they charge you for it. So all of that is an expensive process. Now in European countries and in America, they charge people for waste collection. So they then use that money to pay for the system and for disposal. But that's why we need to make sure that as we are moving towards recycling and that we are as we are moving towards waste to energy, we do it sustainably. We do it in a way that is actually using the resources that we get and minimizing the cost and the impact to the, on the environment. Thank you. Uh, any other students with questions? Yes, Dr. Farah, I want to ask um, what waste but like what type of waste can go through energy recycling, energy recovery, sir? Good question. So it depends on the type of waste. Let's actually go to this slide. So you've got the bio waste, bio waste or biogas. Uh, I'm sure you guys would have heard of similar projects. Those are basically utilized um, microorganisms, biological processes in order to get energy. So what you need is you need organic waste. You need organic waste that has a high calorific value, of course, and you need it to be relatively clean because you don't want to bring something in with a lot of its own microorganisms and that will uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, imbalance the system and uh, make uh, the, the production of biogas less efficient. So this is, of course, very simply, but that would be focusing on organic waste. Now, if we talk about our end-life tires to energy, that's using tires. Uh, 
Um, so the idea is we're working with a cement company um, and in order to uh, basically for their factory, the idea is that they can use end life tire to produce the energy that they need. Then you've got our big sort of waste to energy. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm working on it backwards, but the big waste to energy project. Those, the idea with that is that it can take most when uh, most waste it needs to be something that's flammable and can has calorific value yeah so plastics uh food waste and so on uh the more uh it lights up or it has a calorific value the the better it is for the system so which of and then of course we have waste oil to biodiesel this is just basically converting one form of oil uh into uh, biodiesel that you can then uh, reuse for engines and things like that. Now, which of these do you think would be the easiest uh, with our current non-segregated waste collection? I guess the first one and the second. The first. Yes, no. Well, the second is separate some of our waste. So our construction and demolition waste is separated. The end life tires are separated. Lead acid batteries are separated. So the tires are already separate. So that is relatively easy. Good point. And then the waste to energy, the first one also because it means you don't need to rely on segregation or separation of the waste. So you can put the waste in as it is. And in fact, the more plastics that are in there, the better it is for the energy production. So in some ways, that is the, the easiest one to go forward with. Um, and then some of the others uh, come next. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Le let me, um, in the same topic, how mm -hmm. does Bea see like uh, the, the end goal with regards to the organics? Because um, we have all this, um, environmental concerns about uh, bringing the carbon back to the atmosphere and ultimately if you use it for energy you're burning the the organic mm -hmm. matter and bring it back to the atmosphere and I, I understand that some of the the plastic related and tires this is there's no way of uh, of returning this to to agriculture or public areas but uh, the half of the waste is organic of the the municipal waste is organic and all of this has a huge potential of becoming uh, organic fertilizers um, mm -hmm. through composting or, or biodigesters and, and vermicomposting or many other different uh, biological processes that you can generate these uh, these fertilizers does does Bea see this like a, a, a end goal or still uh, energy is still uh, the the focus well, that's a very good point. Now, one thing that we are trying to do is make sure as we go towards waste to energy, as you would know, there's different systems. Some of them are more efficient at trying to minimize the environmental impact. Um, and we are, that's something that we are very conscious of. And we are trying to make sure that we're working with the best uh, technology and up to international standards. Um, so there are, ways to relatively cleanly go from waste to energy. However, it's, it's a very good question. So at the moment, our focus is to get waste to energy out because that will help deal with the waste uh, and get, uh, I guess, a value added very quickly or uh, before, let's say, even segregation is there, before we really uh, build our recycling streams. However, that's not our main focus or that's not our only focus. So while we're developing that, we're also going towards biogas, um, which of course uh, is a bit more uh, uh, environmentally friendly in some cases, depending on the system that you use. Um, we're also moving towards uh, establishing recycling sectors in general. We're looking at waste oil to biodiesel. We're doing a number of different uh, uh, avenues. We, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket, if that makes sense. And so we know that eventually, if we do things right, there will be less waste going towards the waste to energy. And when you were talking about the organics and the organic waste, we've got a number of other areas that we're looking at. Um, I know my team is looking at uh, two uh, potential solutions and doing research into them at the moment. Um, 
so uh, to see how feasible they are. Um, there's a lot of researchers in Oman that are doing research into how can we um, deal with our organic waste. Um, we're planning on starting a survey of our Mawalah market because that's a big area of, uh, you know, a relatively clean organic waste and that comes in high quantity. So how can we do something with that waste um, and divert it away from, let's say, waste to energy and our normal collection to a, a project that, that maybe uh, needs a more pure form of organic waste? Um, there's talk of trying to uh, really make people aware of the benefits of, of uh, composting, even at a household level. Um, you know, uh, maybe collaboration with other entities like the Ministry of Agriculture to try and make things like that feasible. But also one thing that we are doing is segregating already the green waste as much as we can um, to keep that out of the system so that can be reused. And hopefully, as we go through this process, um, we will try and we will be diverting more and more of our organics, as well as our other recyclables or other waste, away from from uh, the landfilling or waste to energy and towards uh, different areas. Um, uh, just just uh, one more question on this. Um, the tubing system, what will be the, the tubing system? Uh, uh, I've, I've lived in, in different countries that had several beans, even four beans, depending. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, normally the three beans uh, in, in Europe are uh, the minimum. You have recyclables, non-recyclables and organics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all the glass and metals, they go in the in a public beans, they are in the... Uh, one per neighborhood, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. for a different color of bottles and this kind of things. But uh, what will be the, the, the first step of the, the source segregation, the tubing system? What is the planned uh, uh, separation? And how, how, is, how do you think we will move from that to uh, what is being applied in, 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 in countries which have been doing this for a long time? Uh, good point. Um, so at the moment, our plan is to focus on wet and dry. So would have mostly your organics. Uh, dry would have anything that uh, is potentially recyclable. Um, the idea is that those would potentially go through the transfer stations and then uh, go through different treatments. So the wet bin, of course, um, has more of the biological. It can go towards biogas, let's say, or composting. Uh, the dry bin that's got the more recyclables that can go to material recovery facilities and go get separated to support the recycling facilities and whatever isn't taken by uh, recyclers can go to the waste to energy. Um, and eventually what's left from everything can go into the landfill. Now, um, this is something, this system of sort of a two bin uh, system is something that is being done in a number of areas. I know when I was studying in New Zealand, that was the system that we had. It was a, a two bin system. Um, so for now, that is our primary focus. Of course, there's going to be other collection for other waste. Let's say our larger waste, uh, bulky waste, the, that has its own, own collection, construction and demolition waste, more industrial waste. So a lot of the larger waste uh, that we're not talking about household uh, bins uh, is collected separately um, and managed separately. But when we're talking about MSW, our household waste, the, the, the household bins that we have, it would be divided in this way. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other question from the students? Um, yes, Dictor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for if there is any improvement or a good indicators for um, clean society or clean environment here in Oman, especially this year by preventing uh, plastic bags? Good question. Um, we are going to have to do some studies to see what is happening um, in terms of plastic bags. Um, Part of it is depending on the area. Of course, some areas people are doing it well. Some areas, all it is, is they're taking thicker plastic bags and still using it uh, disposably. So there is a lot of a lot to still be done in terms of raising awareness and make 
making people more aware of, of why they're doing what they're doing and the impact it can have on the environment. Um, and yes, we will have to do a lot of studies to really identify the benefit. However, one thing that is out there and that we do know looking from international uh, practices, because Oman is not the first to implement a ban, and in fact, um, there are a number of other countries that have done it, including African countries. Um, it, it does make a difference. Um, and most of that difference is not necessarily something that we see as BIA, because uh, the, the plastic bags, the main issue with them is what doesn't come to us and ends up in the environment. So um, uh, BIA collects the household bins. We don't do the Belladia cleaning, but those areas are the ones that, are, that, that feel the biggest impact. Um, so inshallah, we, were, we played a big part in trying to get this ban and working with the Ministry of Environment uh, who did a really good job. And now we'll just need to uh, basically, again, keep supporting and see how we can um, uh, make sure we're making the most of this, that, that, we, that the society understands the benefit as a whole and that we do the studies that we need. Uh, in in that same point, uh, may I mm -hmm. ask about how uh, institutionally, what is the relationship between uh, BEA as a public company and uh, the environmental authority? Because the, all this, the the public policies and, and the the laws uh, for uh, regards uh, uh, um, wastes in Oman should, should be coming from the environmental authority. But BEA is like yes. the, the, the actor, the, the main actor on how to execute and implement this. Yes. How close is the relationship? How is the, you know, just tell us about how, 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 much, influence, how much influence do you have in the Environmental Authority and how much is the other way around and how, how it works in the practice? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, um, as a company, BEA should not be the ones to set the rules for waste management. And it's uh, basically uh, the local standards for waste management. That doesn't make sense. A uh, government authority needs to make sure that they have the oversight and to make sure that we as BIA, as well as other companies, whether it's industry are working um, uh, effectively working with minimal environmental impact and so on. So that is the environment authority, that is their role. And, and that's why the regulations that come out are, are from environment authority and other supporting ministries. So, I mean, um, that's as it should be. Um, of course, as the waste management company, that means that the, the regulations that come in our area need to be in line with what is necessary and in line with sort of uh, leading towards international best practices. So there's a lot of collaboration in terms of, uh, you know, meetings, uh, documents where we really work towards um, getting uh, uh, the regulations that we need to move towards circular economy. And that means that we need to collaborate with the Ministry of Environment, but of, also if we're talking about circular economy and um, and things like that, there's other ministries that, that will be there, like the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Commerce and Industry and so on. So when we talk about, let's say, the plastic bag ban, that was uh, a really good uh, initiative by the Ministry of Environment. But what it did was it collaborated with us as uh, BIA, uh, company, um, as well as, let's say, the Ministry of Commerce and Industry to make sure that whatever regulations came out uh, were what was needed, that, that it had minimal impact on the industry that we currently have, that it has the most benefit to the environment. And so uh, essentially, um, when it comes to these things, all the, the stakeholders and necessary players kind of work together. Um, of course, under the leadership of the the uh, relevant body, which in this case is often the Ministry of Environment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the students? Maybe no. All right. I, I will ask the, my, my last uh, thing on that I have in mind that I could uh, uh, ask Bea. Um, in Dr. Farah, uh, it's about uh, the 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 part, the the first, the first step on the 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 waste hierarchy 
pyramid mm -hmm. about the, the the prevention yeah the prevention mm -hmm. and the and the this reduction and the uh, this the, the first steps yeah in the reuse mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of in in europe there is a lot of uh, a big role of ngos and uh charities in general that mm -hmm. they are doing quite a big uh the, the small shop a, a huge amount of stops uh, that rechanneling all these uh, uh, used materials for 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 new homes or for the you know um, sharing and um, uh, and and there's a lot of activism online and otherwise mm -hmm. and this culture of uh, creating an environmental conscious how how do you see uh this this culture evolving in oman do you see this type of things happening here in the future uh, and how much because there's a lot of opportunities for the students that are here on the business side and thinking new solutions and being part of this uh, this change that is happening in oman but there is another side of it which is the side of being real leaderships for communities and uh, in organizing people to have uh, community-based uh, solutions and i think the some of the things that are happening in developed countries can be easily mimicked here and uh, do you see that fitting on a money's culture do you see that having a role in the future so that's a really good question and i don't know if you can see my slides but uh, that's basically the concept behind the reuse center and this is done in collaboration with squ for the reason that you said that a lot of the youth have ideas and have the the kind of uh, uh, the passion that would be necessary for something like this. And to be honest, I know when I was in New Zealand, um, the student society and the student uh, body was one of the biggest users of you know these uh, op shops or reuse uh, uh, centers and areas. Um, what I will say, so the idea behind this is that this becomes a hub that then. Uh, Potentially, the idea is you can have different stalls with different um, different uh, SMEs or different uh, groups working on different products and selling uh, their refurbished items um, and all sort of working together. Um, so uh, it would be managed by BIA. We would collect the waste, the bulky items, the clothes and things like that. They'd go towards the reuse center. Also items that are donated, as you said, NGOs and things like that, if items are donated in, the idea is that those can go into the reuse center, whatever profits go back into these NGOs so that um, basically they might receive clothes and um, use clothes and things like that. But what they can get back is uh, maybe refurbished items or uh, money that they can use for their cause. Um, anything that uh, is recyclable and not refurbishable, so you can't necessarily sell it back. It's, it's, it can be used for a, a material recovery, recycling, and anything that can be refurbished, you know, clothes that can be uh, changed into something useful. I mean, we've got uh, people who've come with us uh, for ideas of uh, phone cases from, you know, recycled uh, jeans. Um, you know, people are talking about building furniture where the furniture is made from, you know, chairs are made from the scrap uh, wood from old furniture. The cushions are made from, you know, old mattresses. The covers are made from, um, uh, you know, uh, scrap uh, clothes. I know Geotech has, as part of uh, what they're working on, they, they do quite a bit of this. Um, uh, and I'm sure SQU and other areas, there's a lot of student, I think, movement towards uh, um, refurbishing and reusing items. Now, when you mention the culture, that is true. Um, as as uh, the students uh, here would probably tell you that um, traditionally, we're not necessarily a society that has had to, uh, for at least a long while, has had to use secondhand items. Um, however, I think that's changing. I mean, we've got uh, a, a big online movement, uh, Olex, uh, and things like that, where people do, and even on Facebook, people put their old furniture and uh, others uh, purchase it. I know within uh, my circle, when somebody wants to get rid of an old sofa set or something, uh, first uh, a message is sent to see if anybody needs it. And I know when I got married, my my initial furniture was all secondhand, or at least a large chunk of it was. I've still got, even though I've been married a while now, I've still got my uh, 
a secondhand sofa set behind me right now uh, in my TV room. So the culture is changing, um, and in order to support that, um, BIA is moving towards uh, building that infrastructure that you were talking about, where we bring in all the players, the NGOs, the collectors, and the people with passion and ideas on what you can do with uh, this, uh, these items, and uh, trying and, and build a system that works. Thank you. Last chance for questions from the students. All right, if no more questions, I will just thank Dr. Farah for joining us and, and give this so uh, such a comprehensive overview of the vision of BEA and, uh, and Oman, Oman's vision for the waste management. Um, and I think this is uh, absolutely fantastic that we are in, the, in, in, in a good path here. And many things have been implemented because this is so recent. This is from 2016, basically, in, you know, 2007 started the, 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 the creation of all this, um, this vision, but the implementation is very recent and there's so much that has been done. And we can see that we are in a good direction as a country in Oman. And I have only praise for BEA and Environmental Authority in this, in this sense. And uh, for the students, uh, just uh, give the, uh, a quick message that there's so much to do still and the, your contribution is wanted and uh, uh, any new ideas are welcomed and uh, the, the, the environment is thirsty for uh, innovators, uh, social and technical innovators. Uh, if you have ideas, don't shy off with them, just put them out and they, they let them mature. And everybody wants to, to integrate all oh, everybody that uh, the new, the young uh, people in, the, uh, in, the, in this area you're much welcome and uh, again let's just uh, uh, thank again Dr. Farah for, for coming and being so open with us and, and giving this comprehensive lecture. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I, I noticed there's a question in line with what you're saying. I think uh, uh, Ali asked does BSL out its recycled uh, productions? So I'm basically we as BIA don't want to do the recycling. Um, and this is something that I might not have made it made clear. We want to help manage the waste to allow recycling to happen. Now, what our vision is, is that we support uh, other companies, SMEs, the economy, and allow, allow for growth of recycling from other people. So people like you or anybody who has passion and ideas and really can, can make it work, um, we do encourage... Uh, uh, or we're trying to encourage and support the development of the recycling sector as much as we can without us doing it, yeah? So the idea is that, that, that the society, that it, we initiate lots of small companies, not just BIA itself running all the recycling streams. Um, so as uh, Dr. Daniel said, the, the idea is to, to help build that infrastructure and encourage innovation from, from uh, uh, Amani's in this area of, you know, circular economy, recycling, and sustainable production. Okay. Dr. Farah, I have a question. Um, we're thinking mm -hmm. of a project for this, for this course. We like, we need to do a project or a literature review, but we chose to do a project. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, my question is, um, like the idea is about composting as an end product. Mm -hmm. Is it a waste? Is it a waste to use carton and paper recyclables in the compost process? Like, you know how you need a big ratio ratio of carbon? Is it a waste mm -hmm. to use paper and carton recyclables in that compost? Well, or should we send it to recycling? Well, I will be honest with you. I haven't done enough research into composting to be able to tell you that answer. Um, maybe Dr. Daniel will be better able to answer that question. Yes, uh, the, there is uh, there's more value in paper recycling to make poop and more paper uh, in the in the economic side. But paper is uh, feasible to be composted in high CN ratio com uh, materials. Or actually, they are the gold. They are the gold of the the, the composting because you you when you have 
a low carbon to nitrogen ratio material these are they have a very short life they 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 give off smell and leachates very quickly and in order to stabilize this you need a high carbon to nitrogen ratio and it's much easier to deal with high carbon to nitrogen ratio materials than it is to deal with low carbon to nitrogen ratio so paper is uh, highly valued as a component in this process uh, and uh, as as you know if you if you seen the the, the video from uh, Kala compost they are struggling with uh, you know uh, uh, from uh, woody materials and uh, high carbon to nitrogen ratio materials to have enough of that to stabilize their their um, their sludge that they're using and uh, this is this is something that is feasible and wanted and uh, but I think that the integrated strategy for paper is there's some, the, every time you recycle paper, you're losing some of the quality. So there is a point where you cannot recycle anymore. So if you have even for the paper a, a, a separation system where you, there is some of that that is feasible to be recycled into pulp and new paper and some of it, which is end, end life, should be uh, included in the composting and organic waste uh, recycling systems. So this is basically, we will talk about that more and more during the following lectures and practicals um, and uh, uh, about carbon to nitrogen ratio and paper uh, in between other materials also. Doctor, now I'm disappointed I won't be joining your lectures. <laughs> okay. Oh so yeah, if you, if you uh, most of them will be pre-recorded and uploaded. So it's available for everybody on, on, on YouTube. So you're welcome to to, it's always to have interesting a look to, uh, um, and that is, you know, what you were saying is part of our issue at BIA is, is uh, and, and I think your question about a waste of energy came, uh, you know, was in line with that is there's so many different solutions, whether it's recycling waste to energy, um, biogas, uh, composting, how do you then prioritize um, uh, which projects you start with and where the waste goes? And uh, for us at BIA, part of it is the infrastructure. So, and then of course, which one is more environmentally um, friendly, which one is more sustainable? Uh, but Rashid, I think what you I have- mean, Sorry, but like what I mean is that, is, recy like, is recycling not done very efficiently in your mind that would make it like good enough to go for a compost, even though I understand that recycling paper is better because it um, reduces the amount of raw materials that companies would need to make paper or cotton, whatever. But I mean, right now, as a situation in Oman, is it actually better to send paper recyclables to the recycling companies or is it actually better to use it in a compost? So I think what you're saying is now as it's mixed waste and the paper comes in often dirty, um, then uh, the the... Uh, uh, I guess the quality and the value for something like recycling goes down. So again, yes, you're right. Um, based on the quality of your recyclables and the collection system, what happens, that, that would really help direct what, what happens uh, or what is, is a, a, a priority or the best use for your items, uh, as uh, Dr. Daniel kind of highlighted as well in his, his uh, question earlier. Um, when we talk about our recyclables and when we have SMEs coming towards us, what we often tell them is, you know, if you have an idea, let's say I've had, uh, I, was, I was talking about the accelerator um, and I had uh, SMEs that wanted to use different waste streams. Now, when the waste comes to be, you have to keep in mind that it's mixed at this point. Um, we don't have real segregation unless we're talking about the large, uh, so since the waste is mixed, that limits the, the use or the value as recyclables so, or for recycling. So what we tend to do is we really encourage uh, people to go and get the waste from the source. So let's say somebody wants fish waste, go to the supermarkets where the fish are filleted and packaged and they have a lot, a lot of fish waste. Somebody wants organic waste, go straight to the markets or the fruit and vegetable shops, uh, make an agreement with the shop owner and collect it clean. And in most cases, that means that you can then do 
uh, it, 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 it kind of uh, reduces your limitations and, and makes it so that you have the higher value products. So there are people who are talking about paper recycling and for them, the best option would be um, to go straight to the universities and the different um, areas that produce a lot of paper waste and collect it from the source before it gets contaminated. And then whatever then ends up in our sort of MSW bins, yes, should be going towards more um, uh, composting, uh, let's say, uh, and, and other, other um, uh, systems that don't require clean waste. Okay, thank you, great. Thank you, Did that any other question? question? That was a very good answer, I believe. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did answer the question, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, assuming that there are no more questions, uh, we will release Dr. Farah because she has to uh, other. She has other commitments now, and I, I I think we already took enough of her time, and we thank her again for being so kind with us and, and joining for this event and. Um, uh, thank you again, and um, see you next year as an invited lecture again and giving the same uh, interaction, I hope. Hopefully. Well, thank you all. Honestly, like I said earlier, your interaction really um, made me enjoy this. I, I almost I miss being back at SQU now. Um, so good luck in your semester and uh, the rest of your degree. And inshallah, um, I look forward to seeing your names out there in the world soon uh, making a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.